North Korea has been chronically underestimated, largely because of this satellite image of the country at nighttime. Let me give you an example. In April of 2012, North Korea conducted what was essentially a three-stage, long-range ballistic missile test. A few seconds into flight, the rocket exploded. The debris field was just west of South Korea, and the South Korean Navy was able to go out and salvage the parts. When they reassembled the rocket on land, they found that the bottom half of the rocket contained few surprises, few secrets. As expected, there was a lot of Soviet-era technology. As they got up to the top part of the rocket, they were startled. They found circuitry and electronics sourced back to companies in the United States, <laughs> Western Europe, and advanced Asian economies. But the headlines proclaimed more about how this bold announcement of a long-range ballistic missile test had failed. How could a country that could barely keep its lights on at night be able to attain this type of caliber of missile? A few months later, in December of 2012, North Korea tried again. This time, the final splash field just north of the Philippines also resulted for the North Korean regime the placement of a crude telecommunication satellite into orbit. That's when North Korea started to be taken seriously. And that is also where the puzzle of how the heck the North Korean regime got the circuitry and electronics to begin with began to abound. The whole question, the quest to try to piece together the pieces of this puzzle. To better understand this puzzle, my MIT colleague Jim Walsh and I conducted a three-year study of the North Korean regime. But rather than looking at the national security side of the regime, we looked at the business of the regime. We tried to map out what the business practices, the business partners, and the business pathways were. What emerged was a story of North Korea Incorporated and the two Kims. North Korea Incorporated is a network of elite state trading companies that does business on behalf of the regime. The first Kim that I'm alluding to is Chairman Kim Jong-un, the third generation leadership of this North Korean regime. He is essentially the one who runs North Korea Incorporated very much like a business, a family business. In Asian culture, there's a saying that the first generation makes the fortune, the second tries to manage it, and the third squanders it. <laughs> but Chairman Kim is nothing like a third generation leader of a family business. Under his watch, North Korea Incorporated has gotten better. The second Kim is Mr. Kim, businessman Mr. Kim. He's the individual who did the actual business of North Korea Incorporated in Southeast Asia. Some of his colleagues did that inside of the commercial hubs in China. He is now a member of the 35,000 member strong defector community in Seoul, South Korea, of which individuals of his background only number about 50. When I met him in a lounge uh, coffee bar in a hotel in Seoul, my mind raced as I was waiting for him to show up. The most important thing for me was, what does he look like? What is he going to wear? I expected a boxy, telltale North Korean suit. When he finally showed up, three things struck me. One, he had a very polished British accent. In his university in North Korea, he had studied British literature. And with that came the language capabilities that made him prime for recruitment for North Korea Incorporated. The second was an immaculate tailored suit, a legacy from his time of doing business in Southeast Asia, where some of the best tailors reside. The third, though, were his details of how he did business in North Korea Incorporated. So let me give you a little bit of the juxtaposition. In my research on North Korea, we became very familiar with the previous generation of North Korean procurement agents. These were the individuals who went on business trips to Southeast Asia, to the Middle East, to Eastern Europe. And it was exactly that, a business trip. They would be gone no more than a week, they procured the item, they came back to North Korea. There was very little learning of business. Mr. Kim and his generation were different. He actually lived in Southeast Asian capitals, was a part of the local business community, and as my conversations with him started to light up, the striking thing was the normalcy with which he was able to do this business. After the Asian financial crisis in 1997, I worked in investment banking and consulting in Asia, and working with local clients, 
and looking at the local nature of business, local business partners. In talking to Mr. Kim, I felt I was talking to a fellow expatriate business person. The element that was unique about him was that in living in these Southeast Asian capitals, he learned how to identify local business partners, he signed contracts with them, he took out insurance on freight. He also worked with middlemen who helped arrange the logistics so that the procured item could make its way into a port in North Korea. Mr. Kim would not even know about the route. That's exactly how an expatriate business person would do his or her business in this area as well. The other element that was striking was that Mr. Kim was embedded in Southeast Asia during a period where North Korea was conducting more and more of these tests. After every single one, there would be more sanctions, this idea that we have to dismantle these procurement networks. And yet, rather than dismantling these networks, these sanctions actually helped Mr. Kim. What were initially a source of concern and fear became something that for Mr. Kim, he embraced and he loved sanctions. Why? In the marketplace, sanctions are designed to elevate risk and scare off local partners. And certainly that was the case in certain instances. But for Mr. Kim, what he found was that the elevated risk led to some private companies approaching him. Their argument was very clear. It is riskier for me to do business with you, but I've got a business proposition. If you pay me more commission fees, I can procure this item for you. Not only that, I have local folks who are in my network. Rent my capabilities. In some cases, Mr. Kim probably wouldn't have even dreamed of this kind of network. And yet, that is a counterintuitive and unintended negative consequence of the application of sanctions. So if you take a step back and view sanctions as antibiotics, in certain instances, we will see the antibiotics working. But the increasing dosage on targets and individuals like Mr. Kim has led to drug resistance. And it's this mutation and this innovation and adaptation that really isn't captured in the analysis. Because ultimately, this is a business phenomenon. So, what is the future of North Korea Incorporated? This is not some sort of magical entity that defies all the laws of international relations and defies gravity. It is bound by resources. The elevated commission fees that I mentioned still have to be financed. Mr. Kim was able to draw on the regime's funds, the profits that they made from selling coal to China in the second half of the 2000s. Large sums of money that still reside in China, but that are coming down. The future is already happening. Member states of the United Nations are reporting to the UN Security Council that they are the subject of cyber theft. And the increasing evidence is that there's a high degree of likelihood that there's a North Korean actor behind that. And with the cyber theft, the revenue generated from that particular stream, the financing of this type of procurement is growing. If we are to develop better policies and strategies for dealing with the North Korean regime, we need to better understand North Korea Incorporated. So, when you see North Korea in photos like this, think not of the darkness of the country at nighttime. Think of the bright lights of China and Southeast Asia. That's where North Korea Incorporated is thriving. Thank you.